Corey O'Daniel, Principal Software Architect at The Real Real. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm here to guide you through the stormy seas of Kubernetes, as it were. Uh, but before we get started, I actually want to do an ex experiment. This is a clustering experiment. So go ahead and just grab the hand of the person next to you. No, no, not doing that? Nice, zero trust, very DevSecOps, I love it. Um, so, uh, okay, cool, yeah, but yeah, thanks, uh, you know, despite the plague and all, thanks for coming out, I appreciate it. Uh, I hope everybody makes it home safe. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm pretty excited about Kubernetes and uh, Elixir and Erlang. Uh, I'm the maintainer of a project called Bonnie, which is a um, Elixir-based Kubernetes development framework, so you can actually extend Kubernetes by writing uh, Elixir, uh, which is nice. Uh, also the maintainer of KTX, which is a Kubernetes uh, HTTP client, or sorry, it's an Elixir client for Kubernetes. I know what it is. Um, and also Arbor, which is an adjacency list library for Ecto. Um, you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, at Corey O'Daniel. I'm going to call it Kube Cuddle today. I'm going to say it a lot. I know it's wrong. I know it's kube control. I call it kube cuddle because I love it, unless I'm mad at it, and then I call it kube cartel because um, it's killer still. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I'm on board with Kubernetes, so let's go. I do have one big time warning. There's a lot of YAML in this presentation. So if you hate YAML, I'm sorry. You're out of luck. Uh, but I do have one good uh, consolation prize. I actually made hologram YAML AF stickers, so if you truly love YAML, uh, come and get one and uh, you'll look super snazzy. So this is the question we're asking, right? Are they better together? Um, I did a really scientific poll on Twitter uh, and 50% of the people coming said they are using Kubernetes and 50% said they aren't. So we're going to try to get a little bit for everybody in here. So um, just hang tight. So I'm about to show you something. This is intense. It's a big feature list with a lot of table, a lot of words. Don't get hung up on this. Um, don't get hung up on this at all. This is just the marketing page features of Kubernetes. That's it. Like landing page, high notes, right? Not a lot on the left there. On the right, those are the different components of Kubernetes that you use to get those features. Um, there's a lot of features here that might really float your boat. Um, but again, don't get hung up on this. We're going to see this a lot of times throughout this talk. And we're going to see it. It's going to get a little more intense right now because we're going to see it next to features that the Beam has. And you'll see that there's certain features that they both have. And because they're very different systems, Kubernetes obviously offers things that the Beam does not. So you know, we ask this question, are they better together? Yeah, from, it's, it's, the easy answer is like, absolutely they're better together. Kubernetes can offer a lot of stuff to make our applications more available, higher fault tolerance, more resilience. It can really put the wind in your sails. Um, I'm, there's going to be a lot of these, by the way. The, boat thing, so just get ready for it. But before we get started, what I want to do is, if you're using Kubernetes now in production, raise your hand and keep it up. OK, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. There's a series of questions. We're going to, what's that? I just quit my job, so I was using Oh, that's close enough. Uh, OK, <laughs> so hands up if you use Kubernetes. Now, if your operations team hides Kubernetes via CI, CD, put your hand down. OK, got a few hands still up. OK, if you're on the ops team or SRE team, put your hand down. Hands still up. OK, if your hands are up and you like Kubernetes, put your hand down. <laughs> All right, so there's a couple of people here that interface with the Kubernetes on the daily. They're not on the ops team, and they don't like it. And I feel your pain, and that's not your fault. And I want to tell you how to fix it. Uh, but asking this question here, there's a better question. Like, we've made an assumption. When we get to the point where we say, Can, is Kubernetes and Beam better together? We, we're making an assumption. And the assumption is that it's good for your organization. And that, that's the question you have to ask first. Is Kubernetes and my organization better together? And so let's say you're doing a start, like you're a startup. You got an MVP. Should you put it on Kubernetes? Probably not. Like, this might be funny until you realize that that's not an exaggeration. There's a lot of moving pieces to Kubernetes, and it's difficult to understand at all, right? So if you're, if you're starting a new project, maybe it's not the place for it. Um, before I roll out Kubernetes in an organization, uh, I ask a few questions. Actually, I ask a lot of questions, but here's, here's the high notes. First, do you have an ops team? If the answer is no, the second question is, can you sacrifice application developer time to learn Kubernetes. These are people that are building the stuff that makes your company money. If the answer to that question is no, look at Heroku. 
look at Zeit, look at Fargate, look at Gigalix, or look at anything else besides Kubernetes until you have the resources dedicated to understand what you're operating. My motto when I approach a new project is to bring my experience but not my solutions. Um, and so I use Kubernetes daily. I use it for all of my local development. I'm absurd. I have a Kubernetes cluster running. I do all my application development on it, but it's absolutely not a need and I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. So what we're going to do before we hit that huge list of features, I'm going to show you Kubernetes' best features. And the cool thing about this is it's not on the landing page. It's not on the marketing page. The only people in the room that are going to know about it, or the only people in the world that are going to know about it is the people in this room and apparently people on YouTube. Um, but also, you, you won't find these features in books. And so we're going to look at them. The number one feature of Kubernetes is a simple, extendable API and client. This API and client is key to everything you do in Kubernetes, and it's amazing, and you can extend it, and it's just always the same tool. And, and the CLI tool, kubectl, kubectl, understands your extension. So you can, when you customize software, you don't have to customize your CLI as well. It just understands what you've added to Kubernetes, and you can interact with that. Second thing, learns complexity. What? That doesn't make any sense. How is learned complexity an awesome feature? Because the homegrown complexity that we make building operational systems is debt. You go to your next job, what are you going to do? You're going to rebuild that thing? You're going to try to remember how you did it? I mean, actually, who am I kidding? Nobody takes our Git repos away from us, right? We can just <laughs> copy and paste it into the, new <laughs> into the new org. But like, it's debt. Like, there's this complex systems that we're building, and there's tons of people building features in Kubernetes, and we have a consistent way to work with it. Like, why would we not use that when we move on to a new project or a new organization? And third's the community, right? Hundreds of companies this year alone have contributed to Kubernetes. And you got, you got know, the Googles and the Microsofts, the Amazons. We have Red Hat, VMware, Spotify, Tesla. There's a ton of people contributing back to Kubernetes. Um, so th that right there, those are my three favorite features to Kubernetes. And when you look at this list, if I'm sitting in a room and I'm pitching Kubernetes, or if you're ever sitting in a room and somebody's pitching Kubernetes and they say, let me pick one out, like secret management. We got to get it. We got to roll the Kubernetes because there's secret management. That's a stupid reason to use Kubernetes. And it's not just that one that's a stupid reason to use Kubernetes. Any of these alone is a dumb reason. Anything in this list, there's a much simpler version out there. There's something that's easier to do. And so I would never suggest Kubernetes for a single feature here, right? So these features, the interesting thing about these features is not a single cloud provider offers them. Right? I mean, they sure, they expose the Kubernetes API to you, but like, you don't have a single consistent interface for dealing with everything in GCP or AWS. Sure, you have the CLI tool, but the APIs behind them are very wild, right? Um, learned complexity, uh, it is certainly learned complexity, and it's a lot of different tools, and it's a lot of different services. Um, so what I want to do is I want to look at these three features from the point of view of our applications, which they start out so cute, right? We have a monolith. We have 100% code coverage. No, we got like 4% code coverage. And we're deploying with SSH, right? And then stuff goes wrong, right? Now all of a sudden we got Packer for VM images, Terraform for VM instances, we got Salt and Chef for configuration, KMS for secrets. We're deploying stuff with Bash, why not? Rollbacks, not gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> Terraform, AWS CLI for our auto scaling groups. We got load balancers, DNS records, health checks, access control, ports, firewalls, AIM. Do you need a service mesh? Like, it's like, that's a lot of tooling. And somebody needs to take that, this, and just re, like, mash it up with who didn't, or we didn't start the fire. Like, that's a lot of stuff going on, right? It's a lot of things to cobble together. It's a lot of things to be an expert in. And it's a lot of things to need to know how it works when things go wrong. And I forgot, our VMs are only using 8.3% of the CPU, so let's make a new launch config, assign it to our ASG, roll out new instances, and terminate the old ones. Like We're building complex software, and we're building more and more complex operations. And so when you're building this stuff yourself in an organization, at some point in time, we need to look at the operational complexity that we're creating. And we need to say, what business value are we creating by reinventing the helm? And you're probably thinking, Corey, Kubernetes is complicated. And you're right, 
It has a super high barrier to entry, and that should be operations burden, not application developers burden. And it's partially relieved by EKS, AKS, GKE, et cetera. But again, it's learned complexity. We have this single tool and API to manage workloads. Load balancers, service discovery, DNS records, metric systems, databases, buckets, logging metrics, alerting, all in the same API. And while we're about to look at some of these more technical features, I have to argue that the API and the learned complexity of it is absolutely what you come to Kubernetes for. This is what you pitch when you're trying to convince people that you want to use Kubernetes. And again, you can take this knowledge from project to project, cloud to cloud, well, with caveats, and from job to job. And I have a prediction. In the next few years, the Kubernetes API will become the common API for interfacing with all cloud resources. And I'm going to repeat it in case anyone sticks their phone out, record me saying it, and then call me out in three years from now. In the next few years, Kubernetes API will be the common API for interacting with cloud resources. And that probably sounds nuts to you. But when we look at what we're doing with it today, again, workloads, it's where it all started. Batch jobs, load balancers, DNS records, common stuff, boom. Machine learning models and pipelines using Kubeflow. DynamoDB tables with Kubernetes, that doesn't make any sense. S3 buckets, big query tables. AWS released something a while back called the service operator. It lets you create SNS, SQS, Memcache, and Redis instances all through the Kubernetes API. GCP released a tool called Config Connector that allows you to make any GCP resource through the Kubernetes API. Now, it is Google, so they'll probably kill that at any moment. But in the meantime, I can use GCP to manage, or sorry, I can use kubectl to manage all of my GCP resources. The third thing is community. And you're probably looking at this picture thinking, eh, that's about right for a tech conference. Um, so this is the CNCF uh, landscape. This is, this is, I would definitely recommend Googling this. This is a super awesome visualization. It's a bunch of different applications and services um, in the Kubernetes and CNCF um, ecosystems. And again, you're probably thinking, holy shit. Red circles here are what I want you to focus on. What's in the third box? Uh, just kidding. Um, so, so the red circles here, these are just companies and services dedicated to Kubernetes. Like 20% of this visualization, which is a bunch of software projects, is huge companies investing resources into Kubernetes. You're in good company, even though some of them are bad companies. Uh, so <laughs> to recap, what to pitch people? If you're, if you're considering Kubernetes and you're looking at that list and you're like, that's what we're going there for, like what you want to pitch is it's a simple, extendable API. <laughs> We can build almost anything we want in Kubernetes using their controllers and operator patterns. Learns complexity and the community. So I want to talk about one more thing before we get into the technical stuff. And that's the biggest risk of Kubernetes. And I know unpopular opinions are like a cool thing on Facebook and Twitter or whatever. But how do you guys feel about incendiary opinions? Because <laughs> I've got one. OK. The biggest risk of Kubernetes is not security. You have to secure all that garbage anyway, right? So whether it's Kubernetes or whether you're making it all yourself, you have to secure it, right? And is it moving to microservices? No, just you can totally put a monolith on Kubernetes. You should actually start there before you start breaking your app up. If you decide Kubernetes is where you want to go, start with your monolith and then break off the pieces that make sense into microservices. Definitely don't split your app up because you think you have to because Google does. The biggest risk when deploying the Kubernetes is the leaky abstraction that is Kubernetes. And you're leaking the guts of operations into every single application developer's workflow, right? Tons and tons and tons of YAML. And everyone that had their hands up at the end there, they've been exposed to this risk, right? You get to the point where you're like, I hate YAML, I hate Kubernetes, but also it's like, it's not your job, right? Has anybody ever worked at like McDonald's or like a fast food place? Anybody? No, Jeez, guys. <laughs> Sorry, I'm from Florida, so. <laughs> No, I, my first job was Dairy Queen, but I didn't have to bring potatoes to work to make french fries, right? Like, I, like somebody else did their job and I was able to do my job. And that's how I feel with all the stuff in Kubernetes. Like I shouldn't have to, as my application developer self, deal with that. And we've, we, talk, we hear lots of opinions on DevOps, and it's a practice to make operations better. But I feel like a lot of times you've seen it as a thing that you just toss onto your backend or full stack developers and just give them another task to do. They're like, okay, you're doing this too. 
If your application developers are dealing with DevOps, they're spending less time building business value. So the biggest risk to Kubernetes is exposing that directly to application developers. But at the same time, don't be a gatekeeper, man. Like, curiosity drives innovation. If somebody's truly interested in how this stuff works, like, show them how that sausage is made. But don't expose Kubernetes to developers by default. Use continuous delivery. A good CI, CD platform in place is going to give you a smoother migration to Kubernetes than just going there. And you're probably thinking, Corey, you said leaky abstraction. Kubernetes has a simple declarative interface. Well, spoiler alert, no, it doesn't. And people are probably going to fight me on this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It has a declarative interface. I truly believe one person's declarative is another person's imperative, right? Kubernetes has gotten really complicated, and now we're to the point where our manifests are a lot of how. Like it was before, it's like what we wanted. Now it's how we want it. RAM, down to the kilobytes, fractions of a CPU. Like there's so much stuff that we're telling Kubernetes how to do this thing. Um, and that feels leaky to me, and it puts an operational overhead on application developers. So what I'm going to do is show you the first wall of YAML. And if you think that looks bad, that is an excerpt from a 180-line file generated from a library I wrote called Bonnie. And, and this is creating a Kubernetes operator. And if you can't read that, let me just reassure you that it is declarative. So let's go ahead and like, let's, let's put something into this Kubernetes thing. So, OK, we start out. We got an API version and a type. It's deployment. Cool, I got it. We're deploying an application. This makes sense. Labels, this is information. It's nice to have information, but we copied and pasted it in three places. I don't know why we did that. What happens if we don't? Like that's a lot of th stuff that I already start thinking about, right? And then we get down to our application resources. I don't know. I want my application to run, right? I want. I have. I've been working all day long. I finished a feature. I don't want to think about how many specific mega hizzies my CPU needs to be set to. Like I just want to launch the thing. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> security stuff. Yeah, we got to do that security stuff too, right? Should should I should the disks be writable? Should I <laughs> should I be able to be root? Um, First time you set that no root eh, for, your, for your Kubernetes cluster, you become the least popular person on the planet, by the way. But like, I love YAML. I made stickers for it. But looking at this from an application developer's perspective, and the wise words of Johann Bach, fuck that noise. Like, that's a lot of YAML, right? Operations wants Kubernetes. Developers want Heroku. And so if you want to see what a true declarative interface looks like for deploying an application, that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. So I'm going to take that consultant hat off for a second. Let's do some nerdy stuff. So Beam and Kubernetes, better together. Like That's what we're here to talk about. And we come back to this big old wall of features. And we're not going to hit all these features. But I don't know if you guys know this, there is a pool on the roof. And at the end of the day, I'm going to have a node pool party. 6 o'clock, meet me up there, and we can go through the rest of these that we don't hit today. Uh, what I do want to point out on the left side, though, is a little couple of emojis of what I think Kubernetes can help with and the one thing that Kubernetes can't help with, and that's hot code loading. But we might get there by the end of the talk. Jury's out. What we are going to do is we're going to focus on these ones today. We're going to go through them one at a time. So boom, this is where I have to let you know, YAML alert, like, it's coming soon. So we go back to this first deployment. And here I'm deploying three replicas of an application called Better Together. And this is something I went and totally over-engineered and really didn't even need for this presentation. I spent like three weeks on it. And so that's a life goal. Um, it, is a, it is a prime number calculator. And my goal is to make it distributed so I could do parts of uh, the sieves on different nodes. And if nodes went down, we could just keep on calculating and not lose our calculations. Well, a lot of, I didn't really need to do that. But so more importantly, the, there's something that's missing here, and that's resources, right? This is the first gotcha of Kubernetes. Resources have two fields, requests and limits. Requests set a base, like a CPU baseline and memory baseline that your application's hopefully going to get, hopefully. Resource limits set caps on CPU before you start getting throttled, and uh, caps on RAM so it knows when to um, evict you for out of memory error. More importantly, what you put here, does anybody know what it also does? Sets your quality of service implicitly. Who doesn't expose that to you? 
So <laughs> this right here lands you in something called best effort. That is the shrug emoji of availability. Like, we'll see what happens. The next is burstable. And so burstable, as long as you set a CPU or a memory request in any container in your pod, you end up in a class called burstable. And what that means is, if Kubernetes can schedule you, it's going to give you the resources that you asked for, and it's going to let you burst up a bit. I definitely recommend setting limits, because if you don't, it'll just let you kind of burst on and burst on and burst on. Um, so definitely, I'd suggest setting some limits there. Um, prior to OTP 23, um, not setting limits and, and some of the settings here can make you a bad neighbor. Um, so after OTP 23, um, it will be uh, container aware. So we'll be using C groups. Um, the busy weights tuned a bit better. Um, you still might want to set it to none. Um, but uh, just note that here with these limitations. Um, or wait a few weeks and upgrade. And the last is guaranteed. And guaranteed quality of service can only be achieved by setting the CPU and RAM requests or limits in every single container in your pod. And here's where stuff gets sneaky. Let's say that you're like, I need this to be guaranteed. Like, if I get these resources, this is what I need. And then I got some mutating web hooks and some sidecars that I inject in through some different stuff. And let's say one of those sidecars doesn't set their limits. You lose your quality of service. You're back down the burstable. Um, so you don't actually have it. So if you have something that you need to be guaranteed, I would use a tool like um, Open Policy Agent OPA um, to maybe verify in your deployment pipelines that the quality of service is actually getting set to guaranteed. Um, if you tail um, kubectl git, uh, you'll see that there's an attribute at the bottom called quality of service. And so you can actually see what quality of service you get assigned. So I know that was a lot for just one silly little attribute. So here's a table that you can look at. And there's one interesting thing here. In a new version of Kubernetes, we have CPU affinity, which I actually don't quite know what that means since we're like so deep in like VMs and hypervisors, like what we're getting pinned to, but it does have it. Um, and to get that, you, you have to be in a guaranteed quality of service. Your requests and limits have to be the exact same value, um, and your CPU uh, has to be a whole integer because you can't pin to half a CPU. So if you have an application that benefits from um, some sort of CPU cache and you need to pin it, um, that's how you get there. So deployment strategy. This is another thing that I frequently see just ignored in applications. And it's fine. Kubernetes actually has a pretty good default. But the default is 25% unavailable, 25% surge. And so what that means is, again, Kubernetes has a bunch of stuff where it's trying to place a bunch of pods, right? And so when new pods are coming in, it has to figure out where to put it. And if the, the nodes are full, that's where stuff starts getting complicated. So if you have an unavailability set, what that means is Kubernetes knows it can kill a couple of your pods, which is going to lower your ability to handle traffic, right? So if you have an application that just can't tolerate that, you might want to set the max unavailable to zero just to make sure that it doesn't get killed while you're rolling out new uh, versions of your app. The catch there is you're going to have two versions of your app side by side, which means there's going to be more resources. So if I have this old version of my app here, I've got four pods deployed. I go to roll out the next version. I've got six side by side. The red box there is the IDs of my replica set of my old application. The green box is my new application. So I'm using a lot more resources, but I'm also making sure that my app won't become or won't lose any availability while I'm rolling it out. So this next one. This is a, this is a brilliant quote by a brilliant computer scientist named Nick Young. Um, he said that a pod without health checks is the math lady of Kubernetes. I, that joke was. That's a bad joke. Um, he's the other confused meme, the guy with the question marks around his head and the good smile. Anyways, um, if, yeah, if you don't set health checks, Kubernetes doesn't know what to do with your application. It can look at the CPU, it can look at RAM, but there's a lot of other stuff that helps us determine if our application is healthy. And so we need to set these health checks. Um, there's a couple of different types of health checks, but the two that are probably most important are readiness probes and liveliness probes. Readiness probes tell Kubernetes when we're ready to accept traffic. If we don't set one, Kubernetes doesn't know when we're ready to accept traffic. So if it sees that our pod is started, it might start sending it traffic before it can actually accept it, which will result in gateway timeouts, 404s, who knows. Um, liveliness probes let us do other things to tell Kubernetes if our application is alive. So here, uh, I'm using a mixed task to say, how you doing, fam, which just checks on you know, Redis, Postgres, all the things that I use just to make sure I have connections. And if I exit zero, Kubernetes is like, cool. 
this application is fine. There's a couple different checks that you can define. You can use HTTP, TCP, execs um, to, make these, uh, to make these health checks. This is cool. This is super complicated. There's a lot to affinity. There's a lot of facets to affinity. So we're going to focus on one type of affinity here that I think is particularly important. So when you look at affinity, we have affinity and anti-affinity, which is like, I love you and I hate you. And what affinity is doing is it's telling Kubernetes how I, how I feel well, there's a microphone there. Uh, how I feel about nodes and other pods. Do I want to be near them or do I want to be away from them? It's like, you know, pods of coronavirus. You don't mess with that. You know, it's got an anti-affinity for it. Anyways, um, pods or nodes is the other facet. And then the third part is whether your affinity is preferred or required. And so what we're going to look at is we're going to take a couple of these, mash them together. We're going to look at pod anti-affinity uh, with preference. And so pod anti-affinity with preference. What that means is I'm saying my application prefers not to be on a node with another type of pod. So where is that good? Let's say that I want to make sure that if nodes crash, I don't lose multiple versions or, or multiple replicas of my app, multiple pods, right? So let's say I have three nodes um, and I'm deploying three pods. There's a chance that Kubernetes puts all my pods on one node. One, all my, all the eggs, single basket, right? If that node goes down, application's gone. So I can say that my application prefers not to be on a node with itself. And Kubernetes will place it um, on different nodes so it's uh, not together. Um, this right here is set by setting these max, match expressions. I'm using, using labels to target what I don't want to be next to. Now, there's also this thing called a topology key. And a topology key lets you kind of define what you have affinity or anti-affinity for um, regarding your cluster. So here I'm saying I'm basing this off of the host names. That makes it a specific node. But you can also see that I can do this on zone and region. So I can actually make sure my application is in every zone. So if I lose an entire zone, I'm still fine. And then there's also up here, you see there's preferred and required and then a bunch of other stuff that doesn't matter for this talk. Um, the difference here is, does everybody, everybody know the definition of required? It means it's required. <laughs> so if I say that it's required for my app to be on a different node, and I deploy five, five pods, and I have three nodes, two of my pods aren't ever going to get scheduled because it's required that they can't be on the same node together. So Kubernetes might scale up the cluster and add more nodes. That might be fine. Maybe we're fine with paying for more nodes to have more versions of our app. But if we hit like our auto scaler maxis, max, we might just not get that additional availability of having more pods placed. So um, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with affinities and anti-affinities. You can also do things like I have an application that needs a GPU. So you can say I have an affinity for a node that has a GPU. Kubernetes will only place you on a node with a GPU. Um, if you need quorum, you can use it to control the, uh, the placement of your nodes to make sure that you have a little more resiliency there if nodes fail, so you can maintain your quorum. Horizontal and vertical autoscalers. I forgot to start my timer. This is fun. <laughs> Somebody get one of those hooks and just drag me off stage if I go too long, because I can go forever. Um, so there's two types, horizontal and vertical. Horizontal adds pods. Vertical adds resources. So if we look at an HPA here, this is, this is going to add pods to my uh, deployment based on CPU. And this note, if you use Kubernetes right now and you're like, that looks way cooler than what we have, there's a new version of the, the pod autoscaler that came out recently. So this is, I think it's V2 beta 2. So you can actually set multiple metrics per HPA. Um, so here I'm saying that I want to have 1 to 10 pods, and I'm targeting 50% utilization on those CPUs. Uh, Kubernetes will scale my pods to keep that target CPU utilization. Now, this is using the basic metrics in Kubernetes. There's three metrics APIs in Kubernetes. There's metrics, um, custom metrics, and external metrics. So using custom metrics, um, and there's actually, I'll put a link, or there's a link in the slides. Um, there's a list of all the different implementations, but you can base it off of packets per second and make sure, like if you're getting a ton of traffic, you can scale your pods based on how much traffic you're getting. And then you can start doing some pretty neat stuff with external metrics. So if you're storing metrics in Prometheus, um, you can customize how you do your pod auto scaling, and you can do neat things like here, uh, let me see if I highlighted the line. I did not, I suck. Um, here I am scaling based off of the lag in a Kafka 
consumer. And so I'm targeting 2,000, and it'll scale up and scale down to try to like maintain that lag. So HPAs are pretty cool. Um, Vertical pod autoscalers are interesting. So what they do is they add resources, they add compute and RAM resources to your pods. And so this one's a newer resource in Kubernetes, and it has two modes. It has off and auto. Um, off will make recommendations. So Kubernetes will watch your application, get an idea of what the RAM and CPU should be, and it will actually post recommendations to your VPA of what you should set it to, or what it would have set it to for you. So if you don't quite trust Kubernetes, like actually tweaking your RAM and CPU, you can do this, see what it recommends, and then go in and punch that in. Um, the other mode is auto. And auto is fine, but it does have one quirk. When it adjusts your C groups, um, it restarts your pod. So um, that's just something to know there, and you're also putting all of your RAM and CPU tuning into Kubernetes hands. Um, very much like how it posts the recommendations. When Kubernetes makes a change to your pod, it'll actually post an annotation to your pod explaining in English what it did. Service discovery. That guy found the service. Um, Kubernetes has some uh, DNS features and service discovery built in. It's fairly basic, but it's pretty useful for clustering nodes. Um, anytime you define a service in Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes will create a DNS record that resolves to the pods in your, uh, in your service. And so here, we're creating a service for EPMD um, uh, called bettertogether-epmd. And so the way this works out DNS-wise inside of Kubernetes, here's the template, service name dot namespace dot service dot cluster dot local. So our EPMD service is better together dot prod dot service dot cluster dot local. So if I have something like libcluster, I can set the service name, I can configure it to use the Kubernetes DNS strategy, and now when my pods come up, they'll all join together, which is pretty cool. And so using this, this is, this is kind of neat, using this with turning your availability or unavailability to zero in your, stra uh, in your rollout strategy, ends up means both of your application versions are deployed at the same time. And they'll actually cluster together. Now you can tune your labels, so if you don't like the sound of that, you can tune your labels so that doesn't happen. But here is a deployment happening. You can see all my nodes. The first version is my three nodes from my old pod, and then the second is my new application joining the same cluster. So while we Kubernetes can't solve hot code loading, what we can do is actually join the two different versions of our app together using libcluster. And using Swarm, uh, which is another Elixir library, we can actually pass state off from our old app to our new app. So if we do have some state and some gen servers or processes that we just we prefer maybe prefer not to lose, we can pass that off while we're upgrading our application. So that's why I left it in X, because it's not quite what we're looking for. But like, ah, it's cool. It's nice. It's got tricks. Priority class. So a lot of these um, features can be used together to kind of tune your resiliency, fault tolerance, availability. Priority class is the rich and famous people to the life rafts first of Kubernetes. Um, so we talked about quality of service earlier. Uh, quality of service and priority class are two sides of the same coin. Uh, priority classes are used by Kubernetes to determine uh, if lower prod, lower priority pods should be evicted to make room for uh, higher priority pods. Right, so let's say that we were an e-commerce company and we had a checkout microservice and we're like, hey, that thing makes money. Probably shouldn't be down. We can set its priority class super high, say 10,000, 100,000, whatever, actually goes up to a billion. And what will happen is, is when Kubernetes is trying to figure out if it's resource constrained, which pods to take down, they'll be like, I'm not taking down the checkout service, that thing makes money. And it'll take down other services instead. And we can assign this priority class. You can name it after your service if you want, or you can you know, name it after maybe a different type of quality of service. Naming's up to you. That's the hard part, right? This is Kubernetes thing's the easy part. <laughs> uh, but we just assign it to our pod by saying priority class. The catch here is let's say that people are checking out. Something's going wrong in the cluster. We're deprioritizing a bunch of other nodes. We're starting up more checkout. And all of a sudden, our application's not being served anymore. Well, you can check out 
but you can't get to the checkout service because the whole front end of the application is down, right? Like that's a real risk with priority classes. You can just drown out other applications. And so there's an answer for this, pod disruption budgets. And what these let us do is say how many concurrent interruptions our application can deal with. So we can do things like say, yeah, we absolutely want checkout to always be running and it should never be shut down. But also, the front end, we gotta make sure there's at least two of those so we can get people into the sales funnel so they can get to checkout. Okay, so this next slide is pretty intense. You guys ready? There's been a lot of sunken boats so far, but this boat is beautiful. This boat is so big, it's got three other yachts on it. I don't have a lot of goals in life, but my one goal in life is to be rich enough that I can have two of these. Um, and I don't know if I'm gonna do it in software, but I don't know, maybe I'll just rob a bank. Um, so application operators, so this is a, a little beyond um, uh, just basic operators, right? So operators in Kubernetes are a way of packaging up the expertise of a human operator, whether it's managing a system or doing day two operations, stuff like restoring backups um, or taking backups, uh, migrating databases, et cetera. Um, operators are pretty cool. And so Bonnie, the application that I wrote, as well as a number of other operator tools, operator SDK, if you'd like to write Go, Kube Builder, if you'd like to write Go, Kudo, if you'd like to write extensions in YAML, which is kind of exciting. Uh, there's a lot of tools for building operators. So. And you can do some really interesting stuff with operators. But one thing that I'm curious with, with, with all I've said about Kubernetes and the leaky abstraction and that we should be using CI, CD to deploy things, but like when we think about our apps, like why, why doesn't deploying an application just look like this? Like why, did, what more does it matter than my Docker, the Docker tag that I'm deploying and whether it's going to prod, staging, or dev? And you'd be like, hey, what about application secrets? It's like, cool, that should be involved. Like, why should I have to worry about that? They should just be mounted to my environment variables. Like, why is that my problem? Um, what about security, et cetera? We can write operations or operators, and we can encapsulate all the best practices that our team determines are necessary for reliability, security, availability, um, the actual syntax and naming of everything in Kubernetes and just maybe expose just a bit to application developers so they don't have to deal with so much and you get a lot of bang for your buck. This could configure all my application secrets with KMS or Vault and I wouldn't even know and it's great. It's just like, oh, I'm going to prod. Thanks guys. Version 1.0.2. I think that this is an awesome way to deploy applications and if you've used Helm, you might say, oh, it kind of feels like Helm um, and it, it does kind of feel like Helm. It might feel like Helm values. I prefer this approach um, just because then you don't have to worry about different versions of Helm out there. Your application developers can just deploy things, change the values that they have and not have to worry about a repo or anything else. So do we have enough time? What time is this supposed to go to? 2.30? Is that what? 2.45? 3 o'clock? How long do I have? Well, I'm going to keep going until somebody pulls me off the stage because I got a bonus around security. <laughs> so bonus. Um, so I am definitely not security dude, but I'm going to give you some advice anyway, because that's, that's who I am. Uh, so, um, right, fault tolerance, resiliency, reliability, they're nothing if you get pwned. Um, and so uh, Kubernetes has a couple of resources and attributes built into it to help you with security. So the first one is something called a pod security policy. And this lets you at the cluster level define some security for your pods, um, like disabling root, disable uh, privilege escalation, disable writing the disk, what type of volumes you can access, applying app armor, stuff like that. You can define this at the cluster level and apply it to pods and nobody even has to know about it. Then there's also security context. Security context can be set at the pod and at the container level. It has all the same functionality as pod security policy. So you can kind of tune into certain containers or certain pods um, to, I love that song. Um, so, uh, these are definitely some things to look into. Um, we saw earlier in that big blob of YAML, but here's an example right here. This is some nice low-hanging fruit. Disable privilege escalation. It's going to make people mad. Um, Read-only file system. Run its root. Um, here I said true. Ah. Oh, non-root. Okay, yeah. I mean, disable root, right? Uh, and then set to like a higher unprivileged user. Um, so you can do this through pod security policies or security contexts. And then there's also a couple of tools that are really interesting. So there's a, um, 
a Docker image called distroless. And distroless contains only your application and its runtime dependencies. There's no shell, so you can't SSH into it or exec into it and toy around with it. Um, but there's also no package managers, nothing else, uh, which means it's a lot harder to take advantage of. Oops, I didn't tick next. Um, we also have kubeaudit. Um, this is a usage and security best practices tool. Um, kubebench is a, a CIS, Kubernetes security benchmarker. And then there's a tool called kubehunter, which you can use as a vulnerability scanner, also scans traffic. Um, I think these are all great tools to put in, uh, particularly kubeaudit and kubebench. Like, put it in your IAC's CI CD pipeline. So as you're making modifications to your cluster and people are deploying applications, you can continually run these security audits and maybe trigger an alert through Prometheus or whatnot. So the key takeaways here. One, boats are freaking dangerous. Uh, I've crashed a lot of them. Two, the learned complexity of Kubernetes is a feature. And I can't stress this enough. If you don't have the time or resources to understand what you're operating, use something else. Like Just go use something simpler and deploy. But if you have that time or resources or you feel that you finally need Kubernetes, it's a fantastic tool that absolutely can make your applications better. Simple, extendable API. Um, if you want to extend Kubernetes and you want to write Elixir, I would suggest this library called Bonnie, which isn't too bad. Um, but you can, I mean, you have, you have one tool that you can extend and do almost anything you want. Um, like I said earlier, you can create RDS instances. Um, you can create Postgres instances in your, in your actual cluster, DynamoDB tables. You're starting to see a lot more of cloud providers' APIs exposed through Kubernetes. The community, uh, powerful features. They're going to make you web scale. Almost anything that you need, <laughs> there's already an operator for it. There's Pr Prometheus operators already out there. There's so many Helm charts. It's so easy to just get your cluster running. I would definitely audit what you're running now. Like, just, you know, why not? Um, yes, yeah, so that's it. Bon voyage. Uh, hope you enjoyed the tour. Watch out for the rocks. And, uh, you know, I guess thanks for all the fish. Any questions? No questions? What kind of boat do I recommend? I recommend donating to my GoFundMe so I can get that big yacht and I'll let you on it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it possible to use um, releases instead of Docker containers with Kubernetes? Releases themselves. Yeah. Without, I don't believe so. And I actually tried to make that happen. I actually saw there is a, so I, the answer is I'm pretty sure no. Um, if you really do want to run just bare releases, there is another orchestration framework called Nomad that has a lot of different, I think they call them drivers for how they run stuff. So you can run uh, VMs. Um, containers, or you can do raw binaries. So that's a great option if you do just want to have the bare minimum. Um, it's a great tool. It's by HashiCorp. It, it, it integrates with Vault, Console, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, so it's a really good option if you, if you do just want to run releases. Um, I'd suggest that. I, I, I went down a path trying to see if it was possible. Um, there is a, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank on the name. So there's kubevert, which lets you run VMs, and I misunderstood what that meant. So I was like, oh, sick, I can run a VM. Like, this is going to be great. Uh, but then there's another library, and I can't remember the name. I'll look it up. I think I've got it in my bookmarks, but, so we can sync up afterwards. But um, uh, th there was a library I looked at that I, that I thought was going to make it possible, but it was not. So um, maybe somebody out there is making it happen. I do think there are things we can do to make the, the integration a bit tighter, and I would love to talk to people about that. If you're really, really bored this weekend, I got some, I got some ideas for some things we can build. Anyone else? No. Okay, last question for me. Uh, so, better together? Sorry? Better together? Better together? Absolutely! <laughs> yeah! I mean, come on. I mean, unless you don't have an operations team, then I'd say go use something else. <laughs> okay. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Cory.